For tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Christ for the Nation Seminar, Dallas, Texas. This tape was with Dr. Derek Prince speaking on the inheritance of the saints in light. Monday evening, August the 11th, 1969. This is service three of nine. This is part B in the series by Derek Prince on the inheritance of the saints in light. This message is called, How to Claim Your Inheritance, and concludes with the delivered service at the end. It's not a harmless problem that you can learn to live with. It's something that you've got to be delivered from. You might say, well, Brother Prince, you don't need to tell me that. I have met members of full gospel churches that were homosexual, and they had persuaded themselves that it was all right. You might be amazed, but I'm speaking of facts and people that I know. Now, God has pity on you, compassion, and love, but he delivers you. He doesn't tolerate it. Then there's the whole area of addictive habits. You see, appetites are good. Addictions are evil. An addiction is an appetite that's become abnormal, enslaving, unnatural. And there's a whole range. It's one genus with many species, and more and more are increasing. I was dealing with a young man of 19, just before I came here, had been deep into every form of dope, heroin, LSD, marijuana, everything. I said, how did you start? And he said, sniffing airplane glue. Now, well, you can smile at that, friend, but I mean, that's the way that many begin. This in itself is an addiction. I dealt with a woman in Toronto that had an addiction to nail varnish. Have you ever met anybody like that? She could not walk into the cosmetics department of a major store and behave like a normal person. She had this insane compulsion to go and buy a nail bun and smell it. And when that demon came out of it, it came out screaming and tearing her. However, as I said this morning, the commonest addiction in the United States is food. <laughs> well, this is an addiction. The next commonest is probably alcohol. And listen, if you deal with an addiction, as a general rule, it's never the root an alcoholic has not got to be dealt with merely as an alcoholic, nor a food, food glutton as a food glutton. There's a frustration beneath the surface which causes the Episcopalian to turn to the whiskey or the martini and the Assemblies of God to turn to the cookie jar and the pastry. <laughs> but the basic motivation is precisely the same. And we have far more cookie jar addicts than we have whiskey bottle addicts, in my opinion. Now, you cannot effectively solve that person's problem if you merely go for the alcohol. What was the frustration that caused them to turn to alcohol? That's what you've got to settle. Frequently, it's an unhappy marriage. Resentment or unforgiveness towards husband, wife, or parents. This demon of rebellion that I've spoken about. I've dealt with many people that needed deliverance from the demon of nicotine. And in many cases, I've learned that the demon of nicotine is a branch that grows on the trunk of rebellion. And unless you cut down the trunk, you've not dealt with effectively with the branch. There are certain trunks and certain branches. Rebellion is a trunk. Fear is a trunk. Witchcraft is a trunk. Sexual uncleanness is a trunk. And many of the other things are just branches that fasten on that trunk. Then there's the whole realm of religious error. And Satan certainly overthrows far more people by religion than by atheism. There's no question about that. There are Christians that go into error. This is clearly stated in the scriptures. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, The Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. This is as clear as can be. The faith spoken about is the Christian faith. These people have been in it and depart from it under the influence of seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. And there are millions of people in the United States in that category tonight. In many cases, there are people from backgrounds such as Methodism, 
Baptists, Presbyterians, that had an experience with Jesus in childhood and were never taught that there's anything beyond conversion, felt their need of more, came into some desperate situation and had to look somewhere for power and went to such things as unity, Christian science, spiritism, the science of mind and a whole host of multiplying things which are, you can never keep up with because there's always a new one. They were in the faith and departed from it, giving heed to seducing spirits. You say, well, what is the inner nature of a seducing spirit? I think it's stated in Second Epistle of Peter, the second chapter, where it says there shall be false teachers amongst the Christians who privily shall bring in, sneakily, underhand, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. In my opinion, this is the very heart and essence of heresy. It's a denial of the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. It may contain many nice, sweet references to Jesus, the Master, the Great Teacher. It may acknowledge many of his claims, but somewhere it touches his person, his nature, or his work. And as far as I'm concerned, I will never willingly be associated with any such thing. Because God has ordained that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And friend, if you're in a church that is effectively denying the Lord Jesus Christ, my advice to you is get out of it today. And never again help to propagate those damnable heresies with one red cent of your money. Because you're going to have to answer God for what you do with it. Now, I'm not attacking any denomination. I'm just pointing out certain facts. I dealt with a woman in Chicago, and uh, there are many witnesses of this. I just mention it, because I want to show you the reality of it. And I did not keep count, but a lady there did. And she counted 72 different spirits that named themselves came out of this girl. She was a Pentecostal girl. She had been baptized in the Spirit. And when we were delivering her, we had to stop her speaking in tongues. Till the demons got out. Because the tongues kept back the demons. I don't belittle them. Don't misunderstand me. I said, you can do that later. Let's get the other out first. Now, she had had been brought up in a spiritist home. Which is, you start life with, as the Americans say, two strikes against you. Isn't that what you say? If you start that way. And there were things in her that I think had never come out from childhood. Then she'd turned from God, gone into sin, made a mess of her life. And she was a case book. And as a matter of fact, the Lord let me deal with this as a case book, just for my own benefit and instruction. I spent five hours with my wife, and I'll tell you, I learned more than that five hours than I could have learned in two years in any Bible college in the United States. And at a certain point in dealing with her, the spirit, the first spirit that manifested itself, I, 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 must, I will tell you briefly, I didn't intend to do this, but I will tell you briefly how it started. I was conducting a prayer session and a woman began to behave in a very strange way and I discovered she was from Puerto Rico and she was a spiritist I went over and began to minister to her and another woman this other young woman began to scream with a penetrating scream and this was in the Conrad Hilton Hotel and I thought to myself well this is not the kind of thing we should tolerate here so I left the spiritist and went over to this other woman well this was Satan coming to the help of Satan which I've learned he does many times and uh, as soon as I got to her, the spirits began to speak to me. I didn't have to tell them. The first one said, I'm divination. I said, come out in the name of Jesus. It came out. I'm the sorcerer. Come out in the name of Jesus. I'm witchcraft. Come out. Those are the first three, like that. Then there was a spirit of unclean sex lust, which tore her. And I think I'm going to tell you this tonight. It just shows you the reality of this world. This spirit of lust, and it had a worse name than lust, but I'm not going to mention it here, said to me, I, I'm not coming out. I don't know where to go. Where shall I go? I said, that's not my business. You go. And it struggled and fought, just as in the days of Jesus, it tore this girl. Then when I had gained the victory over it, and it knew it couldn't stay, it said, I know where I'll go. And I said, where? I'm not recommending this, but I said it. And it said, to the Playboy Club. And I said, that's just where you belong. Get going. <laughs> However, after this, a spirit manifested itself. Uh, we'd been praying for two hours by this time, I would think. said, I'm a seducing spirit. And I said, come out in the name of Jesus. 
I'm the seducer of the faith. I said, come out. It said, I'm the chief one. I said, still come out. It said, I have many roots. I said, come out with all your roots in the name of Jesus. And then she began to manifest these things and either act them, mimic them, or name the doctrines. And to cut the story short, and I still got a little tablet with the Conrad Hilton Hotel title on the top, I suddenly realized that these things were the roots of the seducing spirit. And I grabbed the tablet and I started to write them around. I wrote down 37 seducing religious demons that came out of that woman. And if I were to tell you the names of some of them, you'd get up and walk out of this place, because some of them are your pet doctrines. But I don't believe in getting people out of error by telling them that. Because it's not the way to do it. However, I want to tell you one, because to me, this was... <laughs> this, I, I'm a fairly objective person. I was trained as a logician, and I'm British, and I'm not over-emotional. And uh, I was on my guard. I know Satan is a deceiver. And I was just checking on everyone. Now, I do not believe you should have long conversations with demons. Please understand me. But this was like capturing an enemy general and getting information from him, and it was precious. It really was. And I, I've used it many times. I, I must not... No, I've got to be careful. But I'll just tell you the one that convinced me that this was, this was absolutely, unquestionably real and supernatural. Uh, sometimes the spirits would not say their name. They'd say what they did. And they came from all over the world. And they would tell where they came from. And uh, this one said, after a while, we worship God in stones and trees. I said, oh, what else? In feathers, in birds' feathers. I said, what kind of a spirit are you? It said, fetishes. I said, where do you come from? It said, Africa. I said, what part of Africa? East Africa. Now, I'd been a missionary five years in East Africa, so I began to get interested. I said, um, do you know me? Oh, yes, I know you. Where did you see me? I followed you round wherever you went. So I, I, I will not go into the details now because it requires a, 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 an up-to-date knowledge of East Africa. I asked that thing about ten questions of intimate details about tribes and cities and customs and politi political leaders in Africa which no one could have answered correctly that didn't have an intimate, up-to-date knowledge of East Africa and including the understanding of the Swahili language. And it answered everyone correctly, instantly, without hesitation. And I know that girl today. She's a friend of ours today. She'd never been near East Africa in her life. She knew nothing about East Africa, and she didn't know one word of Swahili. So as far as I'm concerned, I know that I was dealing with something that was real, something that was supernatural, and something that was evil. The last thing it said was this. Oh, we also kill babies. And I said, what kind of babies? Twins. The mothers are very sad, said with tremendous satisfaction. And it was true, it had identified the very tribe and the very area it worked with. This tribe, the lower tribe, regularly exposed twins, if they were born, believing that they were the product of evil spirits. Every detail was correct. Apart from these spirits that seduce Christians into error, of which there are multitudes, there's the whole realm of non-Christian spirituality. Now, there are many doors into the spiritual realm, but there's only one door that leads into the right spiritual realm, and that's the door which I spoke about this morning, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Today, America is on a spiritual kick. Materialism and communism... And atheism are not the major forces that contest the gospel. It's the spiritual that America is seeking today. And they are getting the spiritual, but many of them are getting the wrong spirit because they are not going by the only door, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm speaking from experience because when I turned away from Christianity at the age of 18, I turned to philosophy and then to oriental cults and, and, and views of life to find the truth and I studied in some measure Buddhism, Hinduism, even Voodoo. And I became for a time a practicing yogi. So I am not theorizing now. I know. And I got into the spiritual realm, the wrong realm. I didn't like it. It scared me. I got out of it. But when I came to Christ, seeking Christ, the greatest single barrier between me and the Savior was not my drunkenness, nor the wicked life that I had lain. 
It was my yoga. And if God had not given me the first deliverance service I ever participated in, I was the delivery. And it was on the barrack, on the floor of an army barrack room. And I was delivered from innumerable demons. And until they went out, I could not believe in Jesus Christ. I wanted to, and I could not. And looking back now, I see clearly it was my involvement with these oriental cults that had imprisoned my mind to the place where I could neither understand nor believe the gospel. And today I find multitudes of people in the United States being deceived by the same satanic forces, their counterfeits, their snares, and their deceptions. There is no truth in reincarnation. It is a lie from the devil. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. There's no second chance. There's no way back. The rich man died and being in hell and in torment he lifted up his eyes. He did not have a second chance. And you will not have a second chance. That religion that teaches you can come back again and again and work it out and gradually improve and come to the place where you can pass out of your karma is a religion of works. It's not of grace. There's only one way to God. It's through the blood-stained cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one place in the universe where God will meet the sinner that's at the cross because that's where sin was dealt with. And sin is the barrier between God and man. Friend, if you've been involved, and there are so many things tonight that I cannot enumerate them all, but let's start with Ouija boards. They're a, an instrument of the devil. Now, I'm not theorizing. I know if you were involved in horoscopes, if you'd lived in Israel, they would have been put to death for it. Do you say, well, I'm a full gospel Christian, it couldn't happen to me? You read Galatians, friends. You read Galatians for a moment. The third chapter, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? They were bewitched. The next question was, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, the hearing of faith? They'd received the Spirit and they were bewitched. And do you know the evidence of their witchcraft? It's in the fourth chapter. Ye observe times and days and months and years. I'm afraid of you. Lest I've wasted my time on you, Paul says. And when you read the horoscope, you're observing times right. and days and months and years. And as I say, God said, there shall not be among you to Israel one that observeth times. You'd have been put to death. Thank God he doesn't put you to death today, but his, his estimate of what you're doing hasn't changed. Numerology, astrology, horoscopes, palm reading, fortune telling. They're all satanic delusions. You sup with the devil, but you don't have a spoon with a handle long enough. You give him your little finger and he's grabbed above your elbow. Fortune telling is the spirit of divination. It's precisely what that girl had in Philippa. It's satanic. And it will snare you to your destruction. The fortune teller will pronounce Satan's doom upon you. And if you come under that spell, it'll work out in your life. You're submitting to the ordinance of Satan when you do it. I had an amazing example of this. I'll just give it to you. A woman came up in Chicago in some meetings I was in and asked for prayer. And I looked at her and I said, I won't pray for you. You're a medium. She went away, came back about six months later and said, I've repented. Will you pray for me? And I still didn't want to, but if she said she repented, I thought I had no right to refuse. So we prayed. God began to deliver her of some of these spirits. And then we paused, standing at the altar of the church, and uh, she suddenly said, without premeditation, I see you in a car crashed against a tree. And I said, you divining spirit, I'm not going to be in any car crashed against any tree, and I don't accept your edict for me. But had I believed it, had I listened to it, I'd have put myself under that decree of Satan. See, many people go to fortune tellers and put themselves under Satan's decree. Satan makes decrees as well as God. They don't have power against God's decree. You know the last thing that Satan did to prevent the children of Israel getting into the promised land? Do you know what it was? Sorcery. Witchcraft. When every other method failed, hire Balaam and let him put a curse on the people. And I'll tell you, as we reach the climax of this age, as Brother Lindsay said, when every other method has failed, Satan's last instrument is going to be sorcery, witchcraft. Second, uh, Second Timothy 3.13 Know this, in the last days, 
evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That word seducers is the Greek word for magicians. It means precisely what we see today. This satanic deluge of supernatural revelation and power that is being poured out upon the world. It's Satan's last attempt to prevent the children of God getting into their inheritance. Finally, there's the whole realm of physical infirmity, which in many cases is directly due to evil spirits, but not in all cases. And I do not have time tonight to go into details. I prayed for a young man, a Roman Catholic, just recently that had stomach ulcers, serious ulcers. He was taking about three kinds of medicine. I rebuked that demon of ulcers. It left him and he was immediately healed. He went away and had a complete meal immediately. There was a case where it was a spirit of infirmity that had gripped him. Now, may I say briefly, there are certain things which I consider to be normally symptomatic of the presence of evil spirits of infirmity in the physical body. Tumors, cancers, ulcers, migraine, most allergies, most problems in the nasal cavity and behind the nose, most kind of heart infection, arthritis, because arthritis is Satan at work, you see. Twisting, deforming, and torturing. That's the devil. That's what he wants to do. Now, I cannot take time. I've been too long. You've been patient. Now we're coming to action. I want to tell you how you can get into your inheritance. Most of you tonight, if you need help, you can help yourselves once you know what to do. There are some of you that may need help. There are those cases that simply have to have somebody else to exercise faith for them, like Brother Miles was speaking about this morning. And indeed, we recognize this. But God has, has caused me to see that there are multitudes of people that don't have these tremendous, dramatic, obvious needs. But nevertheless, there's an area within where the Jebusite or the Hittite or the Hivite or the Parasite or the Gilgashite or one of these ites is still there. Now, you can get him out. You can do it. These signs shall follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Then they'll follow you. In my name they shall expel demons. That's Philip's translation. You as a believer can expel the demons out of you as a believer. I like the word expel because it brings it right down to what somebody called the nitty gritty. If you inhale tobacco smoke and you want to get it out, you expel it. What's that? It's two things. A decision of your will and an action of your muscles. And expelling demons is very much the same. It's a decision of the will and an action of your muscles. Brother Rannigan pointed out how few Christians realize that when you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you've got to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. They were filled. The Holy Ghost gave them the words, but they did the speaking. Isn't that right? Well, deliverance is exactly the same the other way around. The Holy Spirit is the great agent of deliverance. But if you want deliverance, it's ten times easier when you cooperate with the Holy Spirit. As the devil's on the way out, you give him a kick. You expel him. You drive him out. You contract your muscles. You let that thing come out. Unclean spirits, as indicated in Revelation 16, 13, normally come out of the mouth. Three unclean spirits out of the mouth. That's the way that breath enters or leaves the body. And an unclean spirit is a breath. Just as much as the Holy Spirit is the breath of the Almighty. You receive the Holy Spirit when you drink in the breath of the Almighty. No one else ever was baptized in the Holy Spirit with the mouth closed. Never will be. Never has been. The great secret in getting people baptized in the Holy Spirit is getting them drinking. I've seen as many as 150 people receive the baptism almost simultaneously when I could persuade them to drink. But if people sit there passive and wait to be smitten by the floor, well then they're typical Pentecostals and you meet them. Brother, I've been tearing five years for the baptism. <laughs> And I, my answer is, I know your problem. You're waiting for God to do it all. Yes, I am. I want it that way. Well, I said, you can't have it that way. It isn't scriptural. And it's no more scriptural for you to sit passively and wait for someone to deliver you when you can help yourself. You can expel the demon. Now, here are the conditions. I've got them in my little book. And as somebody said to me, Brother Prince, if it works, don't fix it. And I find it works, <laughs> I don't fix it. It just works. That's all. Any time people make these steps, it works. Number one, humility. Humble yourself, the Bible says. Don't ask God to make you humble because it's impossible. Humility comes from within or it doesn't happen. You've got to do it. And this is very practical because I say to people many times, at the moment of receiving deliverance, 
There may be a brief period when you have to choose between your dignity and your deliverance. And my advice is let dignity go and opt for deliverance because dignity will come back later. But if you cling on to your dignity, you may lose your deliverance. And the basic reason is none other but pride. Secondly, honesty. Be truthful. Call a spade a spade and not an agricultural implement. Call your problem by the same name you call it in your husband and you've got it by the right name, lady. <laughs> oh, I get so many letters from dear one. Brother Prince, I've read your book. My husband has all seven symptoms. What shall I do? <laughs> Sister, how many symptoms do you have? Start with yourself. <laughs> I wish I had an answer to that one, but I've never found one yet. Thirdly, confession of sin. It's old-fashioned, but it's required by God. Now, you don't have to confess your sin to anybody but God tonight. We're not going to have any washing of dirty linen in public here tonight. Sometimes it's scriptural. Confess your sins one to another. But not tonight. And remember, friend, when you've told God the worst about yourself, you know what? You've never shocked him. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> he knew it all before, and he still loves you. Fifthly, renunciation. Renunciation of sin, renunciation of bad habits, renunciation of bad company, and probably most important of all tonight, renunciation of every contact with the wrong spiritual world. Throw away your charms. If you're a hippie, throw away your earrings. Your necklaces, they're all right for some people, but not for you. They're the mark of your bondage. Satan's power is right in them. You'll not get delivered till you get rid of them. If it costs you a lot to throw it away, that means you've got to throw it away. Take your books, cult books, Christian science books, unity books, mental science books, and a host of other books. Don't put them in the garbage. Burn them. This is scriptural. Acts 19, when the believers, listen, came and confessed their deeds, they burnt the books, and the price of them was 20,000 pieces of silver. That was quite a quantity of books. Don't keep Satan's representative in your home and expect deliverance. It will not happen. You cannot have the representatives and tokens and things in your home that glorify Satan and have deliverance from his power. I've known a good Baptist woman delivered from the spirit of idol worship because she had a statue of Buddha on her wall. She was quite shocked, but it was there. Our houses are to glorify God. Amen. There's a very crucial question asked of King Hezekiah in the scripture. What have they seen in thy house? What is to be seen in your house? Horoscopes? You turn that page quickly, sister, from the night onward. You did it just for fun. So what? The devil's hooked you just for fun, and he's having the fun, not you. The next vital thing, and I ought to preach a whole sermon on this, is forgiveness of others. If you have others that you have not forgiven, you cannot be delivered and stay free unless you forgive them. And that's now. It is not an emotion. Forgiveness is a decision. The moment you honestly decide to make it under the impulse of the Holy Spirit, it takes place. It's a decision of the will and an utterance of the mouth. Young people, I want to tell you, you've probably got to forgive your parents. And that is not necessarily young people, because it can go right through life. Your parents may be dead. You still have to forgive them. Because unforgiveness has tied a knot in you here, which is not untied until you forgive. I've seen this many, many times. And then you call on the name of the Lord. Let me repeat those steps briefly. Number one, humility. Number two, honesty. Number three, confession of sin. Number four, renunciation by an act of your will of everything that is evil and in any way associated with Satan. Number five, forgiveness of others. And then you get to Joel 2.32, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now, tonight, you have an opportunity to get out the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Girgashite, the Hittite, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, or the otherite that I didn't mention. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to possess your possessions? Are you going to claim your inheritance? Are you going to act like a man? You're going to put your foot on the situation and say, from now on, Satan, you leave and I possess? God bless you if you make that decision.
I would like you to pray with me now. Now, in this moment of quietness, without any special drama or emotional appeal, how many other of you here would say, Brother Prince, I realize there's an area in me that I've got to drive out one of these aliens, one of these evil spirits. I'm not fully free. I'm not completely at rest. There's an area of inner conflict and torment, defilement, Tonight, with God's help, I mean to drive out the enemy. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand if that is your desire? Well, God bless you. Put your hands down. Now, we have come to a problem. There are far more people that have raised their hands than can go into the prayer room. So I will have to minister to you here. And I trust that you will not be offended by my doing this. If I could take everybody into the prayer room, I would do it. But I cannot. So I'm going to ask that you do this. Those of you that raised your hands and mean business with God, will you stand up where you are and walk out to the front here or down the aisle? Now listen, if there's anybody here that is out of sympathy with all this and it angers you and you're almost resentful or even fearful, my advice to you would be this. In the next few moments, without any display or without attracting any attention to yourself, Just get up and slip out quietly because it is dangerous for you to be here if you're in a critical or opposed or mocking spirit. If you're reverent and sincere and cooperative, there is no danger. But if you feel, and I can well understand it, I'm not critical. You just don't go along with this. Something in you is fighting it. Just quietly, without attracting any attention, making any fuss. Just feel free to leave. Now, you will understand in view of the number of people here tonight that it would be impossible for me to minister to them individually. And it is not necessary. Jesus is the deliverer. And to get deliverance, you've got to get to Jesus, not Brother Prince or any other minister. The majority of you will be delivered without any person ministering to you individually. Some of you may, for some reason, need some kind of special help. And if I or one of the other ministering brethren here feel so moved, and I want to say that to the other ministering brethren, I invite your cooperation if you feel so lame. We may come to you, but please do not look for a human being. People say to me, well, Brother Prince, you prayed for that lady, you didn't pray for me. My answer is, I only move when I see the Spirit of God moving. I cannot do a thing apart from the Spirit of God. You must be the one that gets in such a relationship with Jesus Christ, such sincerity, repentance, and committal, that the Spirit of God will move in you. That's your responsibility, not mine. Now, the way I'm going to do it is this. I'm going to invite every one of you that has come forward for prayer to follow me in a prayer, a prayer in which you confess your faith in Jesus Christ, renounce any sin or evil contact. And then take your personal stand against the enemy within the gate, within the land, and command him to leave you. The Bible says, submit yourself to God first, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You do not need to flee from him. Do you understand that? Jesus has stripped Satan of his armor. He's defeated him. As a child of God, when God is on your side and you are submitted to God, you have the right to make the enemy leave. He's scared of you. You don't need to be scared of him. I know there are desperate needs here tonight. Friend, let's be earnest. Those of you that are sitting here, will you cooperate with us in earnest prayer? I'll tell you there are desperate needs here tonight. Please be prayerful. Worshipful. Unite your faith with these people and let's see Satan defeated tonight. Amen. Praise God. Praise Thank you, Lord. Now, you're going to be shut in now, you with Jesus. All right? <laughs> Forget other people. And come to him through this prayer. He said, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast up. Yeah. So if you come, he will not turn you up. Now, there'll come the moment of deliverance Yield to it. Cooperate with the Holy Spirit. I'm not urging or inviting any manifestation, but if one comes, do not choke it. Do not hold it back because you're holding your problem in. Just let it out. Now you say these words. Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the Son of God. 
that you died on the cross for my sins. That you shed your blood to redeem me. And that you rose again from the dead. I confess all my sins. I renounce all my sins. I renounce every contact with Satan. And with evil spirits. I renounce them all now. I forgive all other people. As I would have you to forgive me. Forgive me now. And cleanse me in your blood. I believe that your blood now cleanses me. From all my sin. And I thank you for it. Now I come to you for, for, for deliverance. You know the evil spirits that torment me. Whatever they be, I renounce them. And I claim your promise. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver me now. Satan, in Jesus' name, I loose myself from your power. And I command you to leave me. Right now, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, you let them go. I'm going to command them to leave you now. Satan, in the name of Jesus, as a servant of Jesus Christ, cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Christ, I come against these evil spiritual powers that have bound and tormented and afflicted these people. And I command you demons in the name of Jesus. Come out of these people now. Loose them and let them go in Jesus' mighty name. Through the power of the blood of the cross of Calvary. Satan, loose that young man right now and come out of him. In Jesus' name, you demon of epilepsy, come out of that young man, right here and now. In Jesus' name, you loose him. I demand it as a servant of Jesus Christ. The scripture says you have to obey me. And I claim my rights in Christ tonight over you. I demand, Satan, you demon of epilepsy, you come out of that young man now. And you don't return. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you're delivered, some of you are. Just begin to praise God immediately. If you know the burden is gone, the pressure is lifted, you feel that deliverance, you feel clean, you feel new, you feel free, you can relax, you've got peace. Thank God for it. Right now. And before you leave this place, Dedicate your life to Jesus Christ. Before you move from the place where you are now, deliberately make Jesus Lord of every area of your life. Every area of your life. Don't leave one vacant area because it's an invitation to the enemy to come back. Right where you stand, say, Jesus, take my life, my relations, my attitudes, my whole personality, every area of my being, I deliberately submit it to you and commit it to you now in the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus. I believe that I'm cleansed. I'm sanctified. I'm set apart to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now just take time to praise Him. Take time to praise Him. Friend, God will do miracles here tonight if we'll just take time to praise Him and wait in His presence. Don't be in a hurry. I have seen that this is what happens. God moves in. The Spirit begins to do miracles. People get healed, get delivered. We never even thought about them. Let's forget man. You that are there just assisting in prayer, would you stand to your feet for a little while and begin to praise God and worship Him? Would you do that with us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Amen. Just keep praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. 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 Glory
This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.